some fun stuff has happened in the world of coding. Specifically, as you've probably already seen given the title of this particular episode, around the advent of AI and how AI is advancing and can actually do some really cool stuff. So uh, yeah, I want to talk about my thoughts and feelings on the, you know, uprising of the machines and how I'm going to be sort of adjusting my approach to software engineering as a whole, knowing that AI is with us. So let's dive into it. So the first thing that's on top of mind of any of my students that I'm, you know, teaching or any students who are considering coming on board to the, the boot camp, or I'm sure any student considering even starting maybe a degree or something in the field of computer science is, will I even have a job available or will coders even have jobs by the time I graduate, right? A year from now, four years from now, uh, 10 years from now, uh, you know, are jobs still going to be available for software or am I just wasting my time and this is ridiculous? So that's a good question. Let's spend some time talking about it and talking about both sides of the argument. So first of all, what I'm seeing and what from what I've seen, I should say, experimenting with the, you know, a AI tool du jour, which is uh, chat GPT, is that, yeah, it's neat. It can do some neat stuff and it can generate code. However, the code that it generates from my experience, and I've been using it to design some, some new apps and I've been using it to test myself on some simple coding assignments and, and so on and so forth. Firstly, the output seems slightly inconsistent and the output is often, and I want to say often because it's more often than not wrong. It outputs code that is incorrect. So in its current form, it is definitely not going to replace any jobs right now. Now, that's probably not what's on the mind of people when they ask the question, am I even going to have a job when I graduate one year, two year, three year, four years down the road. So this is where I need to step back and start to talk to experts and, and do the research around what the experts in the field actually feel about this stuff. So that's exactly what I did. I, I scoured Google. I talked to friends of mine. I'm, I'm in a, a large, I have a large circle of entrepreneurial friends as well as coders and, and so on and so forth. And from my research and, and the time I've spent uh, digging around on the, like I said, on the internet and whatnot, the consensus from what I see is that there's absolutely no certainty whatsoever around an answer for this question. Most people say, from what I'm seeing, and I, when I say most people, most of the experts, the people who work as programmers, the people who have already worked as programmers for decades, the people who work with AI specifically, their answers when asked the question, will software developers have a job in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years from now. Okay, so some people are on the 50 year time horizon. The answers from experts is always, I don't really know, I can't really say. It's kind of like trying to predict if AI will turn on human beings and annihilate us all from the face of the earth. It's a possibility, right? We don't know for sure whether or not that outcome will happen or not. So that's sort of from what I was reading, that's sort of where the experts are putting their answer into. It's in the bucket of, I don't know. And it seems like the answer for this question is a, a probability scale. Right. On the scale of probability, will or if you just do an answer, yes or no, will AI replace coding jobs? Well, if it's a binary yes or no answer, you know, the answer that you would give is yes, it will definitely replace jobs for certain types of coders. Will it replace all jobs? No, it's not going to replace all jobs for all coders. Will it replace all jobs for all coders in the next 50 years, well, that's where it's a probability. We're not sure. We don't know for sure. Maybe there's a 5% chance that that's the outcome. Maybe there's a 10% chance that that's the outcome. But it's kind of like the same thing of, will AI turn on humans and, and destroy all human life and, and turn Earth into, you know, a big ball of fire or something? It's a possibility, but how probable is that possibility is what we're dealing with here. And from what I'm hearing from experts, they err on the side of, I'm, I don't believe so. I don't think so. It's a, pro it's, it's a possibility, but I don't think it's that likely. So take from that what you will, right? 
So in my opinion, how I feel about this as an expert in code, as an expert in working on real world production scale, you know, large applications with millions of lines of code and millions of requests coming in per second. Do I see AI replacing my job as a coder? I am in the camp of no. Okay, now I'm gonna have some bias to that, right? I acknowledge that I have bias in my answer. I'm going to feel like, well, no, there's no, you know, a computer can't replace me because I'm the one telling the computer what to do. So from my seat, I control the computer. I tell the computer, I, I wrote the code, right? I'm creating this software. And can I create software that will replace me? I don't think so. I don't see that as being a likely outcome at all. So I'm in the camp of no, it's not gonna happen. But yes, of course I have a bias. I'm the one, you know, in this seat. Now, what I found has been interesting from my Googling and searching around the internet is that the people who reply with, yes, it is a certainty, AI is going to replace your job, it's coming for your job, kiss your butt goodbye. The people who make those statements, the people who are certain about AI, are the people who know nothing about it, okay? And there's a there's a scientific framework for this, it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, and I, I'm not going to go into all the details about Dunning-Kruger, but it's essentially the more ignorant you are about a subject, the more confidence you'll have when speaking about the subject, because there's all, you don't know what you don't know, right? I don't know, I forget if I've talked about this on the podcast before with the aspect, the pie chart of there's the stuff that you don't know that you don't know. In other words, uh, you have no idea the depth that certain topics go into and all of the nuances and all the things that are involved about that particular topic. So for example, me and cooking, for example, I'm not a cook. Right? I barbecue some stuff, that's about all I do. Um, when it comes to cooking, there is, I'm sure, a gigantic chasm of stuff that I don't know that I don't even know about with respect to coding, or coding, cooking. Uh, that's funny, coding, cooking. There's gotta be, right? There's a whole, I, there, I, I'm not an expert in cooking whatsoever, but I can say with some confidence, like, I'm sure I can learn it, right? It can't be that hard, right? That's the Dunning-Kruger effect in action. I feel pretty confident that I can learn the skill of cooking. Whereas someone who has started their culinary education and has maybe dipped their toes into the waters of learning about cooking, maybe they started, they, they went to a, a culinary school and, and started their first year of learning about, you know, culinary sciences. I don't know if that's the right term or not. You know, that's something I don't know that I don't know. I, I, I don't know what the term is for, is it culinary science? I don't, I don't know what the degree is called. I don't know. Anyway, but let's, let's imagine we start our journey and we go down the world of learning how to cook and we have the first course and then the professor starts to, or the chef, I don't know what they, they're called, starts to teach you about all the facets, all the angles, all of the things, the science and the art that is involved in cooking, I don't know, chicken or something. And you're like, oh my God, I didn't know there, there was that much to know about cooking chicken, right? You, you know, you put it in the, the oven and you turn it to 375 or something and then after 15 minutes you stick a thing in it is it done okay you know i don't know anything you know that's for me you put it on the barbecue put some barbecue sauce on it rub it around there you go it's done but there's probably gigantic amounts of information that i'm lacking about the science of cooking hopefully you get what i'm saying here so dunning kruger effect the more ignorant you are about a subject the more confidently you'll talk about that subject because you don't know what you don't know. But as you start to learn about the subject, in other words, you become more educated on this subject, you start to realize, oh no, there's a whole bunch of stuff I didn't realize about this subject. In other words, there's a whole bunch of stuff I didn't realize about how complex AI is and how, how this or how that, you know, about AI. And now I'm not gonna speak so confidently about, you know, answering, when I answer questions online about, you know, the, the questions about AI. I can't speak as confidently because I, I know now that there's so much stuff that I don't know. So you move yourself from you don't know what you don't know to you now know what you don't know, right? You become aware of your ignorance. So the people who I see talking about the, in, in with certainty about AI replacing X job, like, oh, you're a doctor, you're gonna be out of a job in a year. Oh, you're a lawyer, you're gonna be out of a job in three years. You're a coder, you're done in six months. The people who say that, that's a Dunning-Kruger effect in action at its finest their ignorance is high and their confidence is just as high. So the people who have deep 
learning, deep knowledge, deep education in these fields, their answer is, I don't know. Okay. So again, you can take comfort in that, or maybe that doesn't give you any comfort. But for me, using the tool, seeing how far it's going to have to go in order to get to the point where it can actually replace every single task that a coder does in the real world to get an app from zero to production ready, it's a tall order. Can it be done? Maybe. Maybe in 10 years, maybe in 20 years, maybe in 50 years. It's possible, right? But here's my take on that as an outcome. What happens if, Trevor, you're wrong? Trevor, you have made a prediction about AI in the future, about replacing your job, and you think it's not going to happen, and then 10 years from now, it does happen. There is no such thing as software engineers anymore. There's two things that I can take from that as being the outcome. The first thing is, again, my opinion, if AI replaces software developers, software engineers, coders, whatever you want to call them, I'm lumping all these you know, words into the same bucket here, tech in general, AI replaces all tech workers. If that happens, if that is an outcome that actually comes to fruition and all jobs are now gone with respect to software engineering, probably a lot, if not all other jobs, and I, I can't say all, I hate speaking in generalities like that and making sweeping statements to say all, but let's just say, in my opinion, if AI replaces software engineers, many, many other jobs in the same professional fields like you know, medical doctors, you know, accountants, creatives, you know, artists, video animators, I don't know, start naming any other sort of white collar typey job that you can think of. Those jobs are probably also going to be gone too. And then what is the world going to look like when all of those jobs have been displaced, right? So in my opinion, if that outcome happens and all of these jobs are gone, well, the world is going to look like a very, very different place. And either one of two things will happen in that case. Either we're all insanely out on the street and everyone loses their house and it's it's Armageddon and end of world type situation. Okay, again, possible, right? I might give that a 2% probability of actually happening. But I think the 98% is we're going to adapt. We're going to use our brains as human beings and we're going to adapt and we're going to use the knowledge and the, and the change as it comes in to do something else to provide more value to the marketplace or to provide more value to the new marketplace, the new economy. And this is where I think the second outcome uh, or, or the second potential outcome comes into play, which is there might be a new economy that forms with this entirely shifted paradigm. And it could be one where something like UBI, Universal Basic Income, comes into play. This is where the Star Trek type environment comes into play, where, you know, in the in the uh, world, in the fantasy world of Star Trek, the humans uh, of the Federation, if you're a Star Wars person, you know what I'm talking about. The Federation, you don't really need money, right? You just exist, you live, you are part of this, you know, Federation, and you don't have to really work. The work that you do do is work that you want to be doing, right? You can choose to be a cook. You can choose to be part of the uh, of Starfleet. You can choose to be doing this or that or other thing. And the choice is you're choosing to do the work because it is fulfilling to you, right? You feel that it is important for you to do this work, right? And that's really what work should be anyway. Work should be something that is fun. Now, I don't think work is always going to be fun. I'll get more on, uh, I'll touch on that in a moment. But work should be something that you want to be doing, in my opinion. And uh, and I know this is like a, you know, a very utopian type landscape and future that I'm painting here, but it's possible. This is a possible outcome of AI. And this is what I, th I hope comes from the AI revolution, right? It, that was, I mean, it's probably not likely though. When computers were introduced to the world, personal computers, Right? It was supposed to reduce the number of hours we had to work because look, you know, one computer could now do the job of, you know, seemingly like hundreds of human beings because it has such raw power and isn't that incredible? Well, the word computer comes from the job of a human being doing computations manually, you know, on paper or whatever. So the computers were supposed to usher in this new era of, you know, not having to work as much because now look at the productivity, but really it's just... It, you know, hey, capitalism, it, uh, it, it turned into, hey, now we can be even more productive. Now we can work even more and make more stuff. And so, you know, the utopian future of universal basic income, I, I don't see that as being very probable, but I hope, 
I hope that's where this goes, right? Where everyone can choose to work because they want to, and the stuff they, they, that they choose to do is really fulfilling to them. For me personally, I, I used to play the guitar, I, and I used to, because I, ha I haven't had time to do it anymore. I've been, you know, doing this stuff, which I love this stuff. To me, I prioritize teaching people how to code, talking about code, uh, and helping to change people's lives. I prioritize that over that and my family. I prioritize my family as well over playing the guitar and, and doing music. I used to be very into music when I was a kid. I used to be in a band. I used to, you know, perform on stage and it was great. It was, to me, it was fulfilling at the time. But that's the point here I'm getting at. Hopefully that's the direction that AI goes. So those are the areas where I think we can go. There's some negative aspects where there, there are definitely a probability of some negative, negative things happening. And there's also hopefully a better probability of some really positive things happening. And I guess there's also the probability of nothing really changes too much. That is also an outcome here that could be likely. And that depends on something called an S-curve. I'm, I'm a big nerd now also into a whole bunch of stuff and I learned about S-curves recently. So when you look at the adoption of any disruptive technology, uh, it starts out slow, right? When you look at the adoption of, you know, mobile phones or uh, I guess the internet or whatever, c uh, c computers, right? It starts off slow because it's usually, it's quite new and it's expensive and it's only the early adopters that start to use that new disrupt disruptive technology. So when you look at it on a graph, you know, you're going from 0% to 0.5% in one year. And then the next year you're going from 0.5% to 1.5%. And it's like, okay, well that's a you know bit of an increase, but really you're going from zero to 1.5% in two years, not a big deal. But then eventually the S curve, it's shaped like an S because eventually it explodes up into an exponential rise. Right? So there's an exponential rise to that S curve. And then the reverse happens. So then you might extrapolate out and say, oh, this is gonna be exponential forever. But what happens with the S curve is you get the top of the S where it then rounds out and the, you know, most of the people have now adopted the technology. So there's just not as many people, there's not enough people to continue to adopt this technology to continue exponential growth. Cause you can only grow exponentially for so long until you hit, you know, every human being on earth, right? Then you run out of humans to adopt the technology. So then it starts to flatten out and then you get the super late adopters and stragglers and that kind of thing. And then it sort of flattens out in terms of the adoption. So hence where the, the term of S comes from. Uh, if you had the letter S on a chart-ish, that's kind of what an S curve uh, looks like. So why am I talking about S curves? I'm talking about S curves because I, we don't really know where we are right now on the timeline of the S curve with respect to this particular disruptive technology. If we're at the very beginning of the S curve with AI, uh, which we absolutely could be, I think I would give that a bit more probability of being at the beginning of the S curve. We got a lot of disruption ahead of us. We have no idea what the future is going to look like, okay? And if we are in the middle of the S curve, then AI is probably not going to get too much better, right? It's going to get better, but not to the point where anytime soon, this is where we might say, okay, in 50 years, we might see the out, the, the UBI outcome, the universal basic income, or or whatever, or, or a scorched earth, earth outcome. That's in 50 years, maybe, if we're sort of in the middle of the S curve. So it depends on where we are, and that's just it. We don't know where we are. You don't know until after the fact. So right now with AI, to me, and I'll get into the exciting parts of AI from my perspective right now, it is amazingly useful and exciting and I'm grateful to be able to use this technology now. It feels like the internet back in the 90s when I was a kid, right? When the internet was first coming out and we and we got our, you know, uh, internet accounts where, you know, you could use your modem to dial up and then you logged in to whatever and that, anyway, I don't need to bore you with my childhood details, but it was a really exciting time. There was this, like I said before, this paradigm shift, this brand new window or door opened up that it was like, oh my, like, look at all this new stuff that we can do. Like there's, it was so cool. And that's sort of the same feeling I'm getting with AI. It is so cool. And we have no clue where this thing's going to go, right? It could be the next social media where everyone's like, oh my God, like I, I wish, you know, AI never was turned on and it's doing more harm than good. Or maybe it's the next internet in general where it's like completely changes how the world works. We don't know. But right now it's exciting. And right now as a tool, it is super, super helpful for me as a programmer to be able to leverage AI to do a lot of the boring work that I don't want to have to do, right? Now, 
I'm a programmer, so I'm able to see when I tell it to outline, like, hey, give me a system design on this app idea that I have. It can spit out a system design, and it saves me from doing a lot of the heavy lifting thinking. However, there's mistakes, right? I, I, I haven't had it spit out something perfect before, um, so you have to be a coder to be able to realize, oh, wait, that's a mistake, and that's a mistake, and that's a mistake, and then you have to type in again and say, well... What about this or what about that or why did you and and you can sort of you know guide it to the right answer but again you have to have the underlying knowledge of coding to be able to prompt it with the right questions and the and guide it to the right answer but that's just it right now it's a tool and it is fantastic and it makes my life as a programmer much more easy and much much more fun because it gets rid of the boilerplate, it gets rid of... And that's what code has always been, is getting rid of the boilerplate stuff. Let's get away from, you know, mindlessly typing on a keyboard, and let's get more towards solving problems. Okay, and that's, again, one of the re areas there that I don't know if we'll get a lot of movement on with AI is to truly solve problems the way that we need them solved. So, with AI, if you are someone who's new to programming, or new-ish to programming... What an amazing tool you have to be able to help you learn how to code. Because now if you're stuck on something, if you don't understand something, you can copy paste the code snippet in the chat GPT and say, explain this to me, right? And and hey, that works in the real world too. If you get, you, you've come up to a chunk of code where you're like, oh my, like that, who wrote this? And, you know, oftentimes they'll run into coders who try to be fancy, who try to be clever by writing code that's not readable, right? They've tried to do something that's super optimized that only made sense to them in the month uh, time span that it took them to write that specific code. And then after that month is gone, the same programmer could look at it and be like, oh my God, what was I trying to do here? I don't remember this code. And they have to go through it again and try to understand it. Well, hey, now you can outsource that to chat GPT. Hey, copy paste. What does this code do? Question mark. And chat GPT will give you in words what uh, in English what that code is doing. That's so cool. That's so useful. So as a tool right now, what an incredible tool to add to our tool belts, right? As coders, this is incredible. What I see as an outcome uh, and talking about the outcome of sort of, you know, not much will change. You know, I'm not, I'm not talking about the, the time, you know, the time loop or whatever it is, the time span where we all lose our jobs as coders. I'm talking about the probably more realistic time horizon where we some coders will lose their jobs some people who stopped learning and stopped growing and stopped changing with the times they will probably go out of business yes the coders who continue to educate themselves on these new tools and learn them and embrace them they're going to do fine in my opinion so what i see happening there is there's going to be a lot more startups there's going to be a lot more entrepreneurs who don't have any coding experience who will start up a business and create an app with ChatGPT. And that's where some people will say, oh, there you go, you're losing your job. You know, they should have hired a coder and then they didn't hire a coder and now blah, blah, blah. But you know what? Those entrepreneurs who are not tech savvy are going to hit a point where they're like, okay, this is the farthest I can go with this. I need help. Right. And that's when they're going to bring in coders. So I think all this is going to do is maybe, well, I don't even, I, I can't predict what's going to happen, but I think we're going to have a lot, an explosion of software. I think we're going to have an explosion of businesses that can now be created by entrepreneurs who are not technical, who start the process of creating a product and getting to what is called product mar uh, market fit. When you have someone who can actually create a product that they've been you know, keeping in their brain for so long and they haven't been able to find a technical co-founder, that person will now be able to start the business and figure out if it works or not. And as soon as it starts working, they're going to need a team behind them to help. And that's where the humans come in. That's where we come in as coders. Right. So I think there's going to be more in my opinion, in my brain, the way I think, and I'm one, I have one of abundance, not of scarcity. I see more jobs opening up. I see more need for coders. I see an increase in the need for coders. You know, I think last year the market grew by 17% for coders, right? With all the recession and all the everything going on, I think the market, I think it was 2022, the market grew by 17%. So imagine what will happen now when all these people who couldn't create companies before because they were handcuffed by the cost of hiring a programmer, now they can go and create their product and see if it does work. And when it does work, in some cases, then they're going to start to realize, uh-oh, I need help, right? And that's when you get real coders in, and that's when, you know, 
the real coders can pick up that slack and start to anyway so that's where i see things going i i see an increase in my opinion in the future for coders i see a brighter future because of ai and again the caveat there is i am biased to uh, i have a biased opinion of this because it, this directly affects me right so obviously i'm going to hope that that is the outcome. Uh, but I'm also, like I said, I'm very okay with the outcome of it replaces all of our jobs. Everyone no longer has to work because they have to. Everyone gets to work because they want to. That would be an incredible outcome. Now, final closing statement. For those of you who are not convinced, for those of you who feel like, well, I mean, probably if you're listening to this podcast, you're not in that camp. But if you listening to this podcast come across anyone out in the wild suffering from the Dunning-Kruger effect or the, the, the first part of the Dunning-Kruger effect. If you come across these people in the wild who are saying, I'm not going to pursue a career as a coder because although it looks like it's a, a lucrative career, although it looks like it would be fun to do the coding thing, although it looks nice to be able to work from home and have all these amazing advantages and, and so on and so forth. You know, AI is coming for, for your job and, and it's a doomed field and therefore uh, I'll do something else. Well, for that person, what's more likely? What, it, what outcome is more likely? Let's think as objectively as we can. Is it more likely that AI re will replace jobs for coders and there will never be a need for a coder ever again in the near future? near future being like 10 years or less? Or is it more likely that that won't be the case and that you'll just have to change with the times just like we've always had to change with every new iteration, every new disruptive technology that's come in. We've always had to just stay educated, keep learning, and then you become even more valuable in the marketplace and you end up making more money. Which of those two is more likely? The nuclear scenario or the abundance scenario, okay? And the people who have the mindset of scarcity and the uh, the doomsday and and the worry warts and the everything is going to go bad so therefore i'm going to do nothing about it like that is not a good place to be living right that is not a healthy mindset to have and to take a bet on something that is so uncertain to say i'm not going to pursue that because of a small chance of something going wrong well then what are you going to do you're going to keep doing what you're doing you're going to keep staying in the life you're living that you don't like, because most likely they, they want to make a change and they don't like the life that they're in. So they want to make a change, but they're saying, I'm not going to do this code thing because it's doomed. Well, maybe you would have been a great coder and maybe you're, you're completely destroying that as a potential outcome over something as silly as thinking that the world's going to end. You know, it's just in the history of history that hasn't proven to be the case. And we could, again, I could be wrong. Hey, I, maybe the world is ending. And, and this is, uh, this will be on, I'll be on record and you'll be able to look back at this and laugh at this guy on the internet who, you know, surprisingly couldn't have predicted the end of the world. But yeah, to not do something because you have such a scarce mindset and such a fear-based mindset, I just feel like that's so limiting. I feel like that's such a silly move to make. So I don't know. You could share that with anyone on the internet who has that opinion and just say, look, if you wanted to be a coder and now you're not going to do it, even though you think you might have been good at it because of a potential uh, outcome that is not likely. Guys, that's dumb. <laughs> that's dumb. So anyway, that's it. That's my closing feelings and thoughts around this. Don't make decisions based out of fear, right? One thing, one thing I always have done in my life is I don't make decisions about something when I'm in the lowest of lows and I don't make decisions about something when I'm in the highest of highs, right? Good decisions are not made on either end of that spectrum. If you're having the worst day of your life and you make a decision on the worst day of your life and you commit to that decision and that is a life-changing decision, that's not a good outcome. I, I, you know, maybe whatever that decision was, it could work out for you, but God, like that's a that's a bad place to be making decisions. So to have self-awareness of knowing if you're in one of those two, any, and again, the opposite end of the spectrum too, when everything is going great and you can't do anything wrong, that's also not a great place to make a decision because both of those are rarities. They don't happen often. Often you're in somewhere in the middle and that's where you want to make your decisions. So, okay. Thank you very much for listening to the ramblings of a millennial on the internet about code uh and if you're a regular listener of the podcast hey welcome back i hope to be putting out more episodes uh of the podcast if you have suggestions for what i should be talking about uh, i'm happy to take them some people have emailed me uh trevor at coderscampus.com and they've emailed me to say hey trevor 
uh, I'd love for you to talk about this or that or the other thing. And I'm like, great, I'll add it to my list, right? So I have a list of topics I want to talk about. So Trevor at coderscampus.com, use a subject line, you know, podcast idea or something like that. And let me know what you want to hear about. And I'll probably talk about it at some point. So thank you so much for listening slash watching. And I can't wait to see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves. Happy learning. Bye for now.